Welcome to another episode of Legitimate Matters. I'm your host, William Paris. The topic that we're talking about today is something that is really close to my heart. It's mental illness in the African-American community. Recent reports state that 20% of African-Americans, and I believe it's even more than that, have reported issues with mental illness. But many do not report it. My guest today is Stephen Welch a psychotherapist with over 25 years of experience in the field of mental health. Stephen, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Thank you, William. Now, you've been in this practice for 25 years. Can you tell me uh, what are some of the the trends or what you've noticed about African Americans reporting mental illness? What are some of the stigmas that you've come across in your practice? Mm -hmm. On the hopeful side, more people of color are using psychotherapy. I think uh, stigma has somewhat reduced. Um, and when you think of people in the media, like the show, um, This Is Us, one of the main characters, has a mental health uh, mm. issue. Uh, Dwayne Rock uh, Johnson has gone on record about talking about mental health. Um, Chance the Rapper has mm-hmm. also talked about mental health issues. So I think it's becoming more of a media openness mm-hmm. by people of color. One of the concerns or that, that I have and what I've considered mm. just in my own experience mm. uh, that African Americans might be carrying mental illness from one generation to the next. Mm. That's a big concern of mine and when I think about um, our history or mm. just the history of people of color in general, mm. it just goes back. It goes back over a hundred years. Mm-hmm. It, it started with slavery, all kinds of issues that happened in terms of oppression and mm-hmm. abuse. What's your thoughts about that? Well, I'm going to answer that with a story. Okay. Um, my son is now almost 30, mm-hmm. and I took him to the Slave Museum in Baltimore, Maryland. And one of the, uh, the, the museum is, is designed in a way to make you feel like you're walking into a slave ship, wow. into the mm-hmm. hold. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And one of the images that was there was a woman naked being force fed by the overseer or whoever's in charge in, uh, on the ship. And when my son saw that, he actually kicked the statue oh, wow. because he felt that was such a bad thing that was happening. Why mm-hmm. are they doing that? And I had to explain to him what that was all about. So he actually experienced generational trauma, in a mm. sense, right? He saw what our ancestors went through and had a visceral reaction. Wow. So can you imagine that small example multiplied by a million? And when you think about that, you've had now, now your son had that kind of a reaction to something that is a part of history. Absolutely. These kinds of uh, uh, abuse that we can't even imagine today mm-hmm. were part of the everyday life mm-hmm. of African Americans, certainly in the times of, of, of slavery. Mm-hmm. Uh, you and I had a conversation even prior to uh, today, yes. and we were talking about uh, certain types of experiments that were done. Mm-hmm. Uh, I read up on them myself. You want to talk about that a little bit? Sure, sure. I think one of the classic ones is the Tuskegee syphilis um, experiment. Mm-hmm. That's pretty much a lot of people can remember that. Um, that went from 1935, I believe, mm-hmm. to the early 70s. That's right. So that's not that long ago. And so there's a sense that the black life, the black body was less important. We didn't experience as much pain. We were dispensable. Um, remember, we were three-fifths human. Right. So there was already a view of us as non-human. Therefore, we might, they may perceive, they may be more uh, loving towards a dog than they would be to, let's say, an African slave. Well, for the viewers that are not familiar with the uh, Tuskegee mm-hmm. syphilis experiments, 
Um, that had to do with uh, experiments with African American men who were being injected absolutely with the virus, and and there's people that might be watching that are not aware of that. Absolutely, mm -hmm. um, and it was a movie as well. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if it was Cicely Tyson mm -hmm. that played the nurse that was actually injecting the men, um, but yes, it was to determine how syphilis. Um, impacted the body, what degenerated in the body, what occurred with their mental health. And so that's one way that we were, we were expendable bodies. And that's one way that we were used as experiments. And those, those types of uh, stories where we're experiments makes a lot of us feel generationally that mm -hmm. we cannot trust the medical community. We cannot trust the mental mm -hmm. health community mm -hmm. because we might be being experimented upon. Right, right, and mm -hmm. and there's there's also been the uh, the what is it the uh, J. Marion Sims also was another issue that and he was considered the father of um, modern uh, gynecology. Absolutely, absolutely. And what was going on with that? Yeah, um, he used black enslaved women to explore the reproductive systems. Mm -hmm. So he designed certain um, equipment. For example, the, the equipment that uh, opens the vaginal passage was used on black women. No um, anesthesia, um, uh, did experiments on the reproductive organs. No anesthesia, because it was also viewed that we don't experience as much pain as white people. So that was a very common belief. So is it possible that having a history of oppression and abuse uh, could have a psychological impact on people of color even today? Could that be something that's passed on that if we haven't gotten the help, it goes on from the parents, to, from the grandparents, to the children, to the grandchildren? Well, let me give you a, a very everyday example of that. You know that uh, idea of what we say in the house stays in the house? Right. Mm -hmm. Most people know what that means. Right. And we've used that through generations. Wow. So that we don't expose ourselves to some additional problem outside our household. And so what that does, it causes people to not want to share their pain, their depression, their anxiety. They won't share it wow. because they, they buy into that. It is, it is an adaptive um, strategy, mm -hmm. actually. When you think about it through slavery, you don't want the master to know what we're, what we're going through. You just want to go out, do the work, come back with, a, with the least amount of lashes on you. So that whole idea of not revealing what's really going on with you was a survival strategy. Wow. It's just that now we're holding our issues inside and we're, anxi we're anxious, we're depressed, we're suicidal from that one of those basic um, life saving uh, words. Well, we're going to go to break, but when we come back from break, I want to talk about some of the coping mechanisms or not, mm. and some of, and more about the, uh, the concerns that, uh, that people of color have with going into uh, getting the help that they need. Mm. Legitimate Matters, this is William Paris. This is a very important topic. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. I was always taught to be strong in this world. Told to never let my guard down because at any moment I could be attacked without a moment's notice that my skin made me a target. Skin that has persevered through many trials and tribulations from seeing my mama raped by landlords to my father being beaten and stripped of his manhood to my brothers and sisters being separated into jobs for this bigger system, my skin has always been under attack. Yet somehow we prevail through it all, through all the lynchings, Literacy tests, new Jim Crow's, war on drugs, the gentrifications, police brutalities, food deserts, mass incarcerations. We survived and adapted and pushed to change because our very existence depended on it. Our very existence depends on this. This black strength. Strength that has carried us for decades, but is undermining an important aspect of our humanity and feeding in on itself. Being strong all the time took away our ability to speak about our weaknesses, our sadness, our mental illnesses. This silence is killing us. On top of that, we lack proper mental health care access and endure mistreatments by medical professionals who cannot relate to us in their practice. On top of that, we stigmatize mental illness to preserve this place of our strength, 
damaging ourselves and among black children observing a spike in suicide rates? Because they may feel that their place in heaven is way better than their place here today because when black light isn't valued enough for professional help, adequate housing, or even breathing, life here degrades in value in comparison to life after. Welcome back, I'm William Paris, and this is Legitimate Matters. I'm here having a great conversation with my guest, Stephen Welch. Stephen, in the last segment, we were talking about the history of mental illness and oppression and how this has been carried on from one generation to the next. Mm -hmm. Now, here we are today, and we're talking about mental health, and I'm, many people are now getting the help that they need. It's being recognized, but there's still a, a, a segment or a percentage of the population that still is not comfortable mm -hmm. with getting the help that they need. And there's all kinds of excuses and reasons. Let's talk about that. What are some of the stigmas that are keeping, that are creating barriers? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think it's well uh, known within the community that, um, that uh, to seek therapies for white people. Mm -hmm. It's a white person's thing that they do. Uh, the church, you know, if you are going for therapy, why don't you just pray it away? It almost becomes competitive with the church. Right. Um, uh, or it's a demon that's within that person. They mm -hmm. need to just pray about it. Mm. Uh, the stigma, especially for men, for men to be vulnerable and talk about their mm. feelings, it is not uh, acceptable. It's not socially uh, encouraged. So then you have men and women suffering in silence. But at least women are socialized to talk to each other. Right. There's at least some semblance of that. But for men, we're definitely far less likely to talk about our feelings, especially to another man. And that would be considered some form of weakness or... Uh you talked earlier about uh, some of the bias towards uh, some of the physicians. Does that come up in your practice? Well, I think a, a lot of folks look for someone like me, a person of color or mm. even a male uh, of color, because there's an assumption that they may not be as biased. They may not feel that I'm crazy or judge me as they might think a white therapist or a white doctor might. Mm. And, you know, we all carry our biases. So, for example... It is pretty much known that if a black person or person of color is looking for pain medication, we're drug seeking. Mm -hmm. If it's a white person asking for uh, pain medication, they just need to alleviate their pain. So mm -hmm. we're already perceived as conniving or we're, we're trying to get something really? from, from them, manipulate them. And also, if you... Wait a second. So who's being manipulated? Is it the therapist that's being manipulated or the patient? The, the, the doctor. Okay. Let, let's, let's focus more, let's say, on the medical community. Because right. a lot of the fear comes out of the medical community. Mm -hmm. um, so the doctors may not necessarily have been trained in dealing with people of color. Like, what are some of the issues that they come to their services with? And when you don't understand their barriers, then you don't really, you're not really treating the person in a holistic manner. Right. So, for example, let's look at the opioid um, uh, crisis that's going on, right? So, heroin has been an issue in communities of color for a long time. Once it became a white person's um, issue, oh. all of a sudden, it's, it's a health issue. Now it's a crisis. Now it's a crisis. Mm -hmm. And don't forget a lot of the doctors that were prescribing pain meds. They were, they were prescribing them um, like candy. So, and a lot of those physicians, by the way, were white. And, well, so, if, so now for those that are not getting treatment because of these types of concerns and fears, because that's what it is, it's fear, uh, I'll be judged, um, fear, this physician won't understand me, uh, fear, I'll be made to look weak, then there has to be some other form of coping mechanisms that people, uh, that are instilled in people. Sure. So what are those, if not therapy, then sure. what? Well, let's, let's look at it this way. During slavery, the one institution that we were allowed to have was the church. Mm. So your church actually is your first mental health clinic when you think about it, right? And so because of that, it's instilled now that the way that we cope with our lives is through religion. 
And there's actually nothing wrong with that. Um, however, at times, that will be the go-to approach, and that person is still suffering in silence. Um, another barrier, it could be, um, especially for men, being perceived as weak. And therefore, sometimes the coping mechanisms might be alcohol, drugs, smoking, um, sex, uh, gambling, uh, uh, overworking. Because a, a, a lot of men hide uh, or avoid things by working overtime. Then maybe something's wrong with me. I'm just saying. <laughs> because, <laughs> well, you know where my office is located. Because, <laughs> because I find myself working constantly. But I'm sorry, I digress. But, but these, you know, I, this can... If I may interrupt you, sure. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great example. Mm -hmm. Because at this moment, you realize, oh, I am overworking, <laughs> right? So for some people, it's about, okay, well, why are you overworking? What's going on? Is right. it that you really need the overtime? Is it that you're a perfectionist? Or is it something going on that you are actually avoiding? Right. That might be a life issue. That you're running from something. And, Absolutely. Which is certainly not the case. But, uh, but then that also brings me to the point of people who feel that perhaps they do have some type of mm -hmm. challenge or mm -hmm. they are struggling with it and they're aware of it. Mm -hmm. But how do you actually reach a person mm -hmm. who is aware mm -hmm. but doesn't necessarily know how to break through mm -hmm. where they are to get the help? Because mm -hmm. that's really important. Some people know they need help and just won't get mm -hmm. it. And I understand all of the stigmas and things like mm -hmm. that. But is there a way that a friend or a family person could say, you need to get some help? Mm -hmm. Well, I think in terms of a family member or friend, mm -hmm. I think the, the one thing that they can do is be a listening ear. Mm -hmm. You really can't fix it, but you can be available to listen. Mm -hmm. And doing that, uh, there, are, there are services out there. Um, there's uh, AfricanAmericanTherapist.com. Mm -hmm. There's PsychologyToday.com, which you can find any type of therapist that you want, any zip code, anywhere around the country. And so there are services like that. So a friend could say, hey, here's some services, here's some phone call, here's some places to call, 1-800.net, uh, which is a 24-hour helpline. Um, these are things that are, are available. So if somebody ha had a friend that was going through something, they might be able to just share those, the, those pieces of information. But well, you can't fix it. You can't fix you it. You cannot fix it. And you, if the person it, recognizes right. mm -hmm. that they have a problem, the difficulty with that question actually is that they're going to have to see how it's impacting their life. Mm. So if I'm, going, if I'm experiencing depression, I'm not going to go to work on time. Or I may not even go to work. Um, if I'm experiencing uh, anxiety, I may not want to leave my home. Okay. So then there, there are consequences to the illness. Mm -hmm. But sometimes even when you see those things, you still may not want to get help. I understand. Okay. So it ultimately, it still, it still is the, um, the individual self-determines. What Whether or not they're going to get the help. Well, we're going to go back to break. And I hope that someone watching is taking this in. And if you yourself um, are struggling or think that you might need help, um, continue to watch. We want to certainly give you information that will be helpful. We're going to go to break and continue this great conversation with my guest, Stephen Welch. Legitimate Matters. I'm William Paris. We'll be right back. I found that with depression, one of the most important things you could realize is that you're not alone. You're not the first to go through it. You're not going to be the last to go through it. And oftentimes it happens. You just, you feel like you're alone and you feel like it's only you and you're in your bubble. And, and I wish I had someone at that time who, who could just pull me aside and say, Hey, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. So I wish I knew that. Just got to remember, hold on to that fundamental quality of faith. Have faith that on the other side of your pain is something good. Welcome back to Legitimate Matters. This is your host, William Paris, and I'm continuing this very important conversation with my guest, Stephen Welch, about mental health, mental wellness 
in the African-American community. Stephen, in our last segment, or in the last couple of segments, we've been talking about everything from uh, generational uh, uh, illnesses that have been passed on. We've talked about uh, stigmas. One of the things that you mentioned is the church. We touched on that uh, lightly, but I don't know whether or not the church is really taking as much of a role mm -hmm. in addressing this problem as they should. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got my thoughts and opinions on it, but what do you think? Well, for my research, I only see some very small uh, examples, but they are there. So, for example, some of the church um, elders or you know women's groups, uh, they may actually uh, sponsor them to actually go for mental health training and bring that knowledge back to the church. Um, one of the churches that I was involved in, I was used as a resource, mm. and that was a predominantly African-American Caribbean um, uh, uh, population, congregation, excuse me, and it was a church that I had attended in the past, so I knew some of the people there. I see. And they, got a, they were able to get a grant, a limited grant, and that's how they were able to pay me to provide that service, but it was free for the, um, for the church member. You know, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go there. I'm going to talk about that because when you say that to me, what I hear and what I think about is a church that's, that is progressive, mm -hmm. okay? And, and if, a, if a church is progressive, they are busy trying to create services to help raise up the congregation. And that's why they institute, institute these kinds of programs mm -hmm. because they recognize that. And it's not just mental health. But then you've got traditional churches mm -hmm. that, that are not as progressive. They want to build up the congregation and they want to have the numbers mm -hmm. and they want to collect the tithes and offering, mm -hmm. but they sometimes get stuck in some of the traditional types of practices. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, you know, the, the prayer and, um, but not really recognizing that, um, that it has to go, that there has to be actions mm -hmm. that are associated with, you know, the prayer. Mm -hmm. And um, and I unfortunately have noticed that you know I was raised in the church mm -hmm. and there are some churches that have just been stuck and as a result of that they often lose congregation mm -hmm. they they lose the members because the members are going through so many challenges in their perf in their personal lives and and it's continuously not being addressed and I wanted to just put that out there but I also want to talk about uh, the fact that uh, there are more African Americans that are now therapists. Let's talk about that to address those that don't think that there's anyone out there that will be able to identify with whatever they're going through. Absolutely. But I want to say this before that. I, I want to be really clear that because a therapist looks like you mm -hmm. doesn't mean they get you. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? That's because important. we're our products of our experience. Right. So it's oh. really important for the person looking for a therapist to really shop around. So I just want to say that you can have a person that does not look, look like you and really provide you with the safety, the emotional safety that you need. Because at the end of the day, it's about feeling safe with that mm -hmm. person that's sitting across from you. And that takes time. So, so, so for, for someone who does seek therapy, mm -hmm. I think it's important to know that if you go once or twice, mm -hmm. you, that's not enough time to really establish the relationship with the therapist, and it takes time to build up what you're saying, that trust factor. Absolutely, and I think it's also incumbent upon the person who's meeting with the therapist to really say, I don't trust you, mm -hmm. or I don't think you understand what I'm saying, because that becomes part of our discussion. Right. Why do you feel that way? Then what brought you here? Um, I can imagine this must be very scary for you because it's the first time. It actually becomes part of the work. Mm. And it's okay to say down the road, I don't think this is working, and then Absolutely. continue to look Absolutely. for a therapist. It doesn't mean it didn't work and stop getting the help. Absolutely. It just means that it wasn't a match with that particular therapist. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that does cross um, gender, race uh, lines. That's not, the, the trust is what's the main thing. It's just that some people of color just feel more comfortable to approach another therapist of color. Are there any sign, or is, is there a way, uh, how does a person that's watching the show mm -hmm. uh, saying, well, you know what, maybe I should uh, look for help. Mm -hmm. uh, what would be the, the first step to kind of break free from their, uh, 
that, that the limitations that they were experiencing. Sure. Um, since Obama came in, to, since his presidency um, and the Affordable Care Act, folks can get unlimited mental health care sessions unlike prior to that. Mm -hmm. You might get 10 sessions, 20 sessions. So that part of any barrier is not there anymore. The other thing is if you have a job, usually there's an employee assistance program there. And what that means is you can go to someone confidentially and see someone to talk about your particular problem. Mm -hmm. Usually it's like four sessions, maybe five sessions, and then you refer it to a therapist in the community. And some clients, that's how I get them. Mm -hmm. I'm on their list of referral sources. I see. And so that, so there's services actually at your, actually at your job that, mm -hmm. that are available. And of course, Google. And Google. And Google folks. And, and the great thing about Google is that you can really look at a person's credentials. Mm -hmm. You can look at if there's been any legal um, issues that has happened with this person. You can look at um, their background, their training. Um, if they've written books, if they've done lectures, if there's uh, uh, something about what they do that makes them really stand out, you can do that kind of research. But that's really important. And it would be great to talk about that in another session in terms of how do you find a therapist. And people do reviews. <laughs> that's right. Absolutely. And people do reviews. Absolutely. So you can Absolutely. also look at you know, what, what are people saying, and, and that's important as well. So uh, is, what would you say if you were going to, if you look at the camera and, and someone is listening to this mm. show or watching the show, and they're like, what should I do? How am I feeling? Is there something that you can say? Because I want my viewers to really be encouraged uh, to move forward and take that, that very important step to, number one, recognize that they need the help. What would you say to that person that's struggling with that and thinking about it right now? Um, I would definitely recommend that there are a lot of 24-hour uh, mental health places that you can actually call. 1-800-LIFE-NET um, is a 24-hour service that you can call, talk to them. They can also provide you with resources. Um, again, AfricanAmericanTherapist.com, PsychologyToday.com um, are just two services. Whatever your, your background is, gay, lesbian, woman, um, transgender, whatever your background or your special needs are, there are therapists that specialize in that area. It's just important to do your research, ask your doctor, ask friends that may be maybe seeing a therapist already, but definitely reach out. The services are there. Well, Stephen, it's been great speaking to you. I absolutely want you to come back and be my guest on the show. There's so much more that we need to talk about. Absolutely. And for those of you that have been watching, um, as Stephen said, certainly recognize that you need to help take that step and get the help. And thank you for watching Legitimate Matters. Please remember to go to YouTube and subscribe to my channel. I appreciate you watching and we'll be back soon. Thanks again. I'm William Paris and you've been watching Legitimate Matters.